Welcome to the Nashville Tribute Band Podcast, The Listening Room with Jason Deere. Coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. The official clothier and tailor of the Nashville Tribute Band is the Cater Shop. That's Cater with a K. Catershop.com. If you see the Nashville Tribute Band and we look good, it's all because of the Cater Shop. Man, you look handsome. So do you. You got a nice <laughs> setup there. I like that mic. Where are you? Your house or are you at the church? I'm actually at the house right now. Gotcha. I'll leave later on and go to the church, but right now I'm in my study. Well, Pastor Wayne McCullough, we've been friends for a few years now, and we've been we had the, the great opportunity to to work on some community projects together and to to rub shoulders on a few different things. And uh, I just want to inter- introduce uh, Pastor Wayne, one of one of my friends and a guy who I, I greatly admire. Uh, he's a pastor of the Limestone Baptist Church, sixteen thirteen West Main Street in Franklin, Tennessee the true testament of, of your dedication to the great people that I, I've met and hung out with there at Limestone is that they love you. They love you and they respect you and you can see it in their eyes and you can see it in the way they serve when they, when they follow as you lead them. That, that's, that's a hats off to you. And I mean that as a, and I honor you and, and sustain you in the way you do that. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to watch. We'll talk about a few things about, uh, about Limestone here in, in a little bit. Cause I want people to know about, uh, uh, things they can be involved in with uh, limestone. But first of all, let me just say anybody is visiting Franklin, Tennessee on Wednesday or Sunday or for any of the other projects they have going on the week, go by and see Pastor Wayne and uh, and listen to, listen to the word. It's always a great experience and great people there that are always w- welcoming and, and uh, very kind. What a crazy year we're in right now. Different, isn't it? Very much so. I'm, I'm so glad that, uh, that we, we took a chance to talk. We talked a little bit uh, a couple of days ago. Um, but I'm glad that glad we're talking today. You know, I, I think all of our all of our communities and our our families and uh, our congregations we've all been affected by by what's going. Starting with with COVID and uh, and uh, just with a number of things, just seem to seem to snowball. And there's there's a lot of them. Things pop up uh, and issues pop up, and they're covered up by something else almost as fast as they pop up. Uh, it's hard it's hard to keep up, and it's probably pretty healthy not to keep up in some, in some ways with some of this craziness out there. But what does this all mean? What is this year all about to you? I think that um, I have to respond to that in two ways. I think we have experienced and are experiencing a moment in time, a season, that God is, metaphorically, I would say, allowing us to see sheep and goats. He's allowing us to distinctly determine just how much we have turned either to him or away from him. Okay. Time has allowed us to take God for granted. His prosperity has been awesome. And when things are going well in our lives, we seem to forget the source of what that is. Okay. And so our daily activities, our our routines, our very <laughs> concepts are allowing us to not glorify him. Hmm. In Isaiah, I believe the 43rd chapter 7 verse there about it, he said, God created us to glorify him. Mm-hmm. And it seems that all that we do today is more about me. Hmm. We, have, we have reached a point in society where it's no longer about being our brother's keeper as much as it is, I got to get mine, you get yours. I got mine, you get yours. Mm -hmm. We are not as much concerned about helping each other as we once were. So what, so this year, I believe God is giving a clear message that he is still in control. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, we spent the last decade or last century doing everything that we can to make God less and less in our lives. Uh We spend our times on Sunday going into a service and uniting, if you will, supposedly with him. But somehow or another, he doesn't matter on Monday or Uh Tuesday or Wednesday or the rest of the week. Uh That's not the kind of God that we should be serving, or at least not the way we should be serving Uh God. Uh Because one of the things that having to do virtual church, etc., has clearly defined for us, and God has taken what the enemy has meant for evil and is using it for good, is that 
the Bible tells us in John, the fourth chapter, the 23rd and the 24th verse, that there will come a time when we will no longer worship him on this mountain, hmm. but that we will worship him in spirit and in truth. We've gotten too connected that the church is represented by the building instead of by the people, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. by the soul and the actions and the activities of the people. Mm-hmm. When people all say, well, the church is not doing this and the church is not doing that. But somehow they have forgotten that, well, that means that I'm not doing it because mm-hmm. I am the church. <laughs> That's and so true. therefore, as we come together in, in, as we go through this epidemic and this, if you will, virtual church, we should, we may not be in the same building because mm-hmm. the church isn't closed. Mm-hmm. The building closed what God is closed. Mm-hmm. And open what God has opened. It, it, he's the only one that can open and close the doors. That's right. So if we're not in the same building, we ought to at least be in the same house. I don't know if you got that. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah, we ought to at least be in the same house. And that's the opportunity I think that God is trying to give us throughout this season, this year. God is trying to bring us into his house mm, that's because amazing. we have too often just passed by pretending we've gone in. Well, the Spirit testified when 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 truth is is given when truth is preached. We we know that. And and what's one thing that's amazing about this is that your sermon, you know, potentially last year was seen by 50, 60, hundreds, you know, a couple hundred, 300, 400 can be seen by someone in the Philippines. Now, you know, that, that's, uh, that as we've turned online, there are no boundaries to what can get out. And we have no idea even where. And some of these things that are recorded, you know, the things we say today, they may show up long after you and I are moved on from this life. And, uh, uh, and that's a very interesting opportunity that, that has certainly exploded this year into, into a new thing. With it. Tell me something. Tell me, a, tell me some victories that have happened in the and the people of Franklin that you know uh, since since this has all started this year? Well, I think that it comes to mind that God has continued to operate in what we call miracles, but it's an everyday event for him. Mm. You know, we have, we've had some miraculous healings that we have seen. We've seen young lady in our congregation who basically was given up on. Uh, they was in dire needs of, uh, of a liver transplant. And God, through much prayer, and I believe responding to the, the, the prayers of the saints, gave her a liver transplant. And, and the first one didn't work, didn't didn't fit. But it, the next one, next opportunity, God immediately brought about, and it's miraculous just to see what what He has done and how her life has responded to that. Mm. We've seen several healings of that nature. We've been able to see God, even in a time such as that we're in, manifest his faithfulness in allowing us to continue to minister to people through the Matthew 25 and manna from on high because he supplied all our needs according to his riches and glory. And and so uh, what I would say that God has said, try me. See what I'll not prove myself. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that that what I have seen this year, and actually continually, and it grows, he just keeps bringing you closer and closer by what he does so that you get a greater appreciation that he is God, mm-hmm. God all by himself. Mm-hmm. But he continues to just be faithful. That, that's probably, if I had to surmise it, it would be that God has been faithful. He has, his, he has demonstrated his promises and he's allowing us to show our faith and trust in him. Mm-hmm. We're either going to trust him for everything because God is not a sometime God. He's an all time God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, from the very beginning, from literally uh, the Garden of Eden, Satan has so, I hate to use the word masterfully, but I'll, I will because he, he is a master of lies. But he so successfully mixes truth with lies. You know, he'll give you a little bit of this so you listen, and then he'll he'll waylay you with the lie. And it seems like this year is a year of deception. It's a year of uh, of lies in so many ways. And when it comes to you know just all the sources that we of ways we get information, and I I, th- I feel like I feel like in the middle of all in the middle of all this, this is a year of division if we let it be a year of <laughs> division. We see so many. I mean, we've seen things divided, and, and you know what. The racial unrest that we're seeing right now, it, there are great things that are going to come from it, and there are things that needed to come from it. But it, it's the easy, easy division. What I'm wondering is what's what's next to divide? Because COVID, well, you know, what's I, coming? I, I want to give you something and two things that I've heard 
that I heard. First, I, to back to your statement about how the devil will mix a little truth with deception. In reality, he never gives you truth. He will always give you something that sounds like the truth. Yeah, it's to set up the lie. <laughs> yes, because in, when he dealt with Adam, he didn't necessarily tell Adam the truth. He just distorted God's word when he dealt with Eve. Excuse me, when he dealt with Eve, and then she passed it on to Adam. And and the truth of it was is that he made us doubt what God said. And I think that's the opportunity is that we're doubting. When, when the enemy can create doubt in what we know to be truth, because Jesus says, I am the way, mm-hmm. truth and the light. Well, Jesus, Jesus is, there's no doubt in that. Mm-hmm. You have to believe it. Mm-hmm. But the devil will try to represent what that truth is in a different way so that you receive his deception. Mm-hmm. The second thing that I want to say to you is, is that you speak of this in the terms of division. And I would suggest to you that division has been ever since Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. But we need to identify for what it is. Too often we are swayed and we miss the direction of where we are to go because we look at it in a more f- definitive manner. We look at it in a very small and minute matter. We look at this as division and and segregation and racism, etc. And the truth of the matter is broader than that, but simply as good and evil. Mm. You can call it segregation, it's still evil. You can call it racism, it's still evil. You can call it hatred, it's still evil. And that's the point. Paul says, when I try to do good, evil is always present. Mm. And so that's what's happening here, is that some people, and Forbid that I would offend anyone, but I must call truth what it is, because all too often we have gotten to a society where truth is now what I think it is. Mm -hmm. Truth is the word of God, Mm -hmm. because he is the standard. Mm -hmm. Think about it like this. If someone shoots someone in the middle of Second Avenue, (laughs) most of us would think that it's what? Murder. Sure. Well, what has made murder wrong. I mean, why is murder wrong? It's because God has placed within humanity an innate understanding of his will and what's right and what's wrong. And our very instinct of right and wrong is the fact that God has placed within us the ability to know instinctively, just like a newborn baby, when they, a, a, a little child, when they're walking around. My grandson, he's going on about 10 months old, but he knows when to look at me to see if he's about to get into something that's wrong. Right. Now, now, where did he get that from? And so, therefore, it becomes our obligation or as a grandparent to help him to perceive the difference between right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The opportunity exists is, is that there is a tremendous amount of teaching that's going on today that is not teaching right because no one is bothering to study the standard. Mm-hmm. We have embraced the world and loose, if you will, the will of God to wherever it may be, but it doesn't matter to us. Mm-hmm. And whatsoever we loose in earth will be bound, will be loose in heaven. Mm-hmm. And bound in earth will also be bound in heaven. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is this, that we must know the will of God to be able to serve God. Mm-hmm. And Paul tells us that we ought to do what? Study. How many, how many Bibles are sitting on uh, end tables and coffee tables that have dust that has probably covered them? Mm-hmm. But it's not just enough to read the word. And that's what too many people are doing. But he says, hide thy word in thy heart mm-hmm. that I may not sin against thee. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think is, is, is an opportunity as I address those two things to you. There's too many people that have decided that my truth is that what matters. Mm-hmm. There's too many people who have decided that how, our, how a person conducts themselves is irrelevant as long as I get my agenda. Mm-hmm. Notice what I said, mm-hmm. my agenda mm-hmm. in play. How is it that for hundreds and hundreds of years, people got the words of the Bible, they got it from, for a long time, just from wherever the priest or the pastor was, they have to go to Sunday, they have to go to where that was. And finally, in about the turn of the century, maybe in the 1800s, they, people finally had a family Bible. They ended up having all the pictures and the photo albums and what, and there was at least one. Well, about 1950, you know, I'd say the middle of the 
the 20th century, people started putting individual Bibles in their own hands and everybody had their own Bible, you know, that kind of, kind of changed. And now we, we've got it on, on phones and everywhere. There, there's just no reason not to have access to, uh, to Scripture. Yet, people are reading it less and studying it less. Well, there's something that scripturally, in which we would read, but it's in Romans chapter 10. There about the 13th through the 17th verse, it talks about faith comes by hearing hmm. and hearing the word of God. How can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach except to be sent? One of the greatest problems is that there are a lot of false teachers out there. And what is being heard is creating popularity and entertainment, but not challenging people to excel to the standard of God. For God encouraged us in Matthew, the, the Jesus teaches in the spirit, uh, teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. He's, he has about like six different subjects, which seem to be inter, not to be related at all, but yet are connected because it prescribes to the fact that when you become a believer, there is a change that is required because it ought to be visible in you. Mm -hmm. But he says that, that be ye perfect, but God is perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's not talking about you doing everything perfect, but it's talking about you mimicking the character. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what the character is, and if you will not listen to the spirit, when you, when you say that you don't know what a lie is, or, and, and here's one of the greatest challenges. As Christians, the word of God was created to help other Christians, because the, we should apply the word of God to all our circumstances and situations so that we may help each other. We that are strong are to bear the infirmity of the weak. Our opportunity is, and if you would allow me to, as an illustration, not as a condemnation, mm -hmm. but how can Donald Trump ever realize what the standards of living a godly life when the people of God won't call it what it is? Mm. When they won't tell him he's lying. When they won't tell him it's not acceptable to God. When they won't tell them it is not godly to speak brashly to folks and rudely to people, to call people names. When, 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 won't, when, when we won't tell even our, our political representative that we ought to be having compassion for one another. And so we find ourselves in the situations like today. You know, coronavirus is not the first thing that we have ever experienced to mm -hmm. be an epidemic. However, though, in times past, we have maybe more spiritually prepared to address those things because today we are not spiritually addressing it. How quickly and how often have you seen refer, people refer to prayer and God as a resolution to this epidemic? Not enough. In times past, mm -hmm. we would have maybe had at least a prayer vigil. We would have at least called people to pray, united in some sense, mm -hmm. but not today. Yeah. You know, in my lifetime, we have had things before. I guess in my lifetime, we just, uh, we I, I would have never imagined in January, and probably you wouldn't have either, that the volume of things would have drastically changed so fast. Kids all out of school, people not working, people working from home. I mean, there, these are drastic changes that we, we are, are surprised. And I'm sure they've happened back in the 1918, uh, you know, uh, fever epidemic when so many died. I'm sure that they happened back then, but I wasn't around back then. So, but what also happened immediately is that we all got the opportunity to have a little shock factor and stop and change perspective. And, and here, if we, if we choose to, I, I, you know, when my, when my, when we were on family vacations, we were driving in the car every once in a while, something would be happening in the backseat with kids going crazy. Back in the days we were cl cl climbing all over the station wagon, no seat belts and that whole thing. And my dad, every once in a while would go, stop and he'd slam his hand down you know it just uh, and we'd all just freeze and i feel that's like that's i'm not saying that god said stop and slammed his hand down but this this has done that where we gotta stop and we gotta we gotta take a look and and i feel like so many are looking at what's important and that that might have that might have spurred on other things too but i think the silence that, that's happened in the shock is a worthy thing for us um, and I, I think there are blessings that, that, that go along with it. My, m one of my biggest worries is, and I've talked to a lot, a lot of the, a lot of pastors and, and preachers over the years and, and I ask them, I always ask them the same question. I think you and I've had the same conversation. I love to hear about the great things that are going on in different congregations. And I also like to hear about what the biggest worry is. And the biggest worry seems to often be the youth because the youth aren't found 
in our congregations like they, they used to be. And that scares me a little because that's how we got this we got this generation underneath us that is not looking to those of us who have lived a little while. And we, we might be wrong in a whole lot of ways, but we know a thing or two because we've been there. Tell me about that in, in, in your congregation. Tell me, tell me, about, I know that the, at the same time, and I know what you're getting ready to say, there are some of the most valiant youth that have ever lived right now, strong, smart, spiritual people, but they're, but they're few, seem to be few. Well, I think we have to put everything in a proper perspective. The, the challenge that we have is to make sure that we are administering the word of God in an end time season. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, I believe just, let's just take this moment that virtual church is reaching, I think, greater numbers than we once did. Hmm. Why? Because we, God has caused us to have to meet people in the places that they are. Uh Where does a youth spend his time? on the phone. Uh Uh What do they do? Text. When you want to talk, they'd be sitting on the same couch and talking (laughs) to each other on the text. So then you you have to learn that, yes, maybe they should come to church or maybe they shouldn't, uh, or maybe we shouldn't make such a big deal. The point is, is that we get the word into them to hear. And I would say at Limestone, that God has been I, I hate to use the word amazing because that just doesn't, it's not sufficient to, to address how God is moving. But the one thing that, that he has taught me, at least I believe I've learned, is that no matter what age, no matter how young, and no matter how old, I do know that the ability to influence youth is greater for me when I have known those kids from whatever age, particularly when they were very little. And I didn't get too old to still take the time uh-huh. to love them, to interact with them, to make them feel and know they matter. So that when they grow older, they know that I'm not just presenting that now. This is who I've been to them all of their lives. Uh-huh. And therefore, I think that we have missed out on one thing that the word tells us, train them up in the way they should go. And when they grow old, guess what? When they, if they go, they, they will return back to the word. And that's, we don't, we're not taking the time to teach what we were taught. At least, even if grandpa and grandmama didn't go to church, they get what they did. They made sure that their children and their grandchildren went to church. You go to Sunday school. You go to, well, there's not as much of that is happening. But I am just absolutely not shocked, but thankful that Mm. God has enabled me to uh, interact with youth and not have what was so often referred to, they don't speak of it that way now, the the generation gap. Mm -hmm. I tell our seniors and stuff, if there ever was a time that you should make sure that we are loving on all people, it's now because as we grow older, our circle of influence can get smaller. (laughs) Because sure. those people will die off. So we, you don't want some uh, a company and attention from anybody at a certain age. And the more that you interact with all people, the more you increase the, the uh, capability of having someone to have companionship with and joy and friendship with. I, I think that age is just a number. Mm-hmm. But it's a number. If you make it a difference, it will be a dividing thing, as you spoke earlier. It just has to know that how do youth get their training if they don't get it from seniors and elderly people who have grown up and gone through, as you say, we've been through this. Well, how much are we passing on? Mm-hmm. How much are we sure. willing to share? I remember at times when I was coming up to sit on the porch and hear my grandmother tell those stories and about how things used to be and and to be able to watch that when they went to church on Sunday, go up on a hill, and it seemed like they were, boy, they were gone a long time. <laughs> but guess what? You begin to, it begins to resonate with you that why they were there, because they wasn't counting time, they were worshiping. And so, but now we've gotten everything is time, a schedule. Mm-hmm. We, I got to get out of church because I got to go get the children to, to football and basketball practice and stuff. And this is, this is not going to be popular. But I guess at times I'm just not a popular person. <laughs> but 
we should control what's going on in our lives to the point that we quit adhering to what the coaches and the others start telling us about when we ought to practice. Mm-hmm. And say, well, no, I can't practice on this day because that's my night that I do this for the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, we we should we should have them to schedule around the the Lord instead of us scheduling the Lord around them. Couldn't agree more. I, I I would encourage any any coach of any sport or any uh, any instructor of any kind. Any I mean, just stay away from Wednesday and Sunday. Why not? I mean, so I don't care. I, honestly, whether you're religious or not, it is healthy for one day a week. <laughs> I mean, whether whether you do it because God said to do it or not, it is healthy one day a week to take a break from your routine and to, as for your family to just do something. It's different than every other day, and Sunday is, is a great day to do that. Now, from a religious perspective, there are blessings to putting putting on the brakes and slowing it down and spending a, a, a day of worship and just a day together as a family. That's just Isn't that happening now? You have no choice. You're, you're <laughs> supposed to be at home. And so guess what? We have to be right. together. Forced, and- forced compliance. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It is true. You know, the the only thing I know how to say, you, you've taught me many things. And I think my experience, the spirit in my experience of, of what our friendship has really been been based on in the years that we've known each other has taught me things that are, are I consider very valuable to my heart and to my to my spirit and to to the, the way I think. And I think I think you know if it feels like this is a classroom and this life is a classroom in some ways. And in the class in the classroom, it feels like to me the only reason I think that there is differences in us all. There's differences in colors of skin or, or cultures or whatever. It's just to teach us how to get along, teach us how to love no matter what, teach us how to, to learn as, as and to see as Jesus did. And that is seeing the person as the essence, as a child of God and, and where all that mortality just disappears. And those, uh, you know, pe- people talk about charity and, and how, you know, charity is a pure love of Christ, which I, I completely believe. I don't think those real pure moments of charity come along every day. But we do have those moments when we truly have an experience with someone else and we see them only as our brother or sister and only as a child of God, just like we are. And there's nothing else that matters or separates when there's that pure line of of love. And that's a process. I I don't know. You and I talked about this the other day when we talked about I don't know and you don't know how to fix Detroit. We don't know how to fix Minneapolis. We don't know how to fix New York. And we probably don't even know how to fix Franklin, Tennessee, but we know that we can make a difference here, here is the, as the microscope, you know, comes down on the, on the place where we live. And what I love about you and what I appreciate about you, and I want to say it publicly is that, let me just say, you can take two brothers that are raised in the same family by the same parents, went to the same church their whole life, and they can sit down and they can open up the scripture and they can argue over one verse <laughs> because we're, we're capable of that. We all have different ways that we think. We have different ways that we believe and that we worship. I don't believe that uh, a husband and wife or a friendship works when people sit there and they say, hey, this is what's wrong with you. Pastor Wayne, this is what's wrong with the way you think, the way you do things. That's going to cause problems right away. No marriage is going to prosper in that. No friendship is going to prosper in that. But when we focus in on the things that we have in common, and, uh, and that's what you and I have always done. Our friendship has been based on the fact that we both love Jesus and we believe him. And I'm not saying you and I are going to agree on everything. We're not. We're not, but we do agree that we're better when we focus on the things that we do have in common. And that's the only way I know to do that. Because if you ever think that you're better than anyone else, no matter that's wrong, it it can't be right. I don't care what the reasons are. I don't, I don't, I don't care what the reasons are. There is when, when truth is taught by a person to people in a building, then God is in it and God is in it. And uh, it doesn't mean that we're all right all the time, but it, I do believe that it does mean that when we honor each other in the way that we make efforts to bring light and the light of Christ to other people, and we join together in those things, like we've, you and I have had the opportunity to do on, on a few occasions in the community, it's good. It feels good. It feels right. And all of a sudden, nobody cares about, for heaven's sakes, skin color or who's got money or who's got this. I mean, if you take all the skin color away, am I wrong? If you took all, if we were all exactly the same, we would find some way to separate, to separate ourselves. Anyway, that seems to be kind of human nature, but the idea is to all be one is to all be one. Um, and, and, and to love each other. John Lennon may have been a weirdo, but he was right in that one thing. Love is all we need. Well, 
I, I guess I, I capture what you say in these words. I often say this because I think we missed the point. God created us unique individuals. There are no two people that are identical, even identical twins. There are no two people that are the same. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what your skin tone is, or I don't care what your upbringing, because we can be exposed. If, if an accident happens on Fifth and Broad, and there's 20 witnesses around, you have 20 different stories. No two people see things the exact identical way, mm -hmm. except that there be some sense of, of saying, okay, this is the standard. Mm. And that's why we must learn to appreciate each other's differences because if we can't get along down here, don't tell me we're going to make it into heaven. God's not going to put up with our chaos. He's not the author of confusion. Mm -hmm. He doesn't put up with the, the kind of uh, the, the separationist and the cynicism that we offer to each other here because even in my own family, people are going to think identically as I do. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I think that's what makes us who we are is to be able to appreciate the difference in one another. And that difference is, is that I think God had purpose that we would have to get along with each other in spite of, because that's what Jesus did. He loved us in spite of, he went and died on a cross while we were yet being a sinner, while we were still yet fighting and fussing and complaining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He died in anticipation and expectation that the light would bring us into the closeness of God. Mm -hmm. Why? Did, did Jesus say, say to us, okay, you have to become a, uh, you have to take on Judaism to become a believer in who I am? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, be as I am. He said, Jesus tells you that he's supposed to, you should mimic him, the character, because he's following whom? The Father. Yes. And guess who has the right to demand that we be who we are supposed to be in him? And that's God. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he created us. Mm -hmm. And if he owns us, as Psalms 24 tells us, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell there in it. So guess what? He has every right to say, this is what you're supposed to look like because he created it and only he knows what it's supposed to look like so right. anybody's trying to if, if anyone else who's trying to tell you what you are look like is totally inaccurate because they're not checking in with the creator mm -hmm. yes it's a great day of learning i'm telling you this is this is a this is a super interesting year and i'm uh, i, I want to be grateful for the things that we're learning because there i believe there's more good going on right now than there is evil i think the I think the evil that's being spread and shown all over the place is is not as much of a problem as the good that's being done where the rubber meets the road on, with with each individual right now. I have to believe that. I was talking a couple of days ago with uh, Marie Osmond, and I'm not I'm not I don't want to drop names. Uh, Michael Jackson told me to never do that. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I was, I was, I love Marie. She's a good friend of mine. And I, we were, and she's now doing the talk, which is there's the view. And then there's a talk. She's on another, another network. I'm not even sure what the network is, but, uh, and she's got to be so careful about everything that they say. I mean, they're, they're, they're on there to, to give their opinions and their various opinions and, uh, and, uh, to represent America and different, but it's just very interesting how, how careful, but she said something really important. And, and anyone who doesn't know Marie Osmond should know this about her. She has a great heart and with that is full of love for everyone. She's been a great example to me, but she, she pulled out Ezekiel 36, 26 and she said, and it says a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now I can't fix history. I can't fix the history of every person and people. And I don't believe that we're ever going to have the world the way we want it until that moment that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. And there's no way that I'm going to see a difference between me and you as we lay at his feet. That's going to heal it all. And, and, and what I pray for myself and for everyone I care about and know is a new heart, it is a new heart in, in Jesus. And, um, and I know you share that, <laughs> that same heart and that same. I think you say something valuable there. And I want to, I want to cause you to 
pause on it for a minute and think about it. The problem with history is that too many people are living in it. It is history of the Civil War and people still living in it today that allows us not to go to our future. Because of the history in our current now, we're living in a relic of the past instead of saying, okay, that was then. Uh-huh. And now is now. And how will it affect that which is coming? What would happen if we begin to live in the present and not the past? Uh-huh. Because you see, you have to remember the things that people did to you for you to continue to hate them. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, you, you know I, if I'm going to always remember your trespasses, I can't forgive you and then move into the now and to be able to take hold of the future because I'm still holding on to the past. That's why when man becomes born again, he is a new creature. Mm -hmm. He has to let go of the past. Mm -hmm. He must take hold of the now and therefore receive God's will for his life, which is a changed life. Matter of fact, his old mind is gone. He must take on a new mind. That this mind is in Christ Jesus be also in you. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, every day is an evolution of learning more and more about who God is. I often tell people that God, having a relationship with God is like peeling an onion. Every time you pull back a layer, you see more and more of the onion and it's more exposed. Well, mm-hmm. God is continually through his word and through what he does to reveal himself to us. And so therefore, if we're going to deal with and make life all that it should be, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. abundantly. Well, if we're going to have abundant life, then we got to quit holding on to past history. And we can't trust, I mean, we can't even trust what we're seeing around the world right now. We can't trust it, any of it as truth. We don't even really know. That's the big confusion. And that's the reason why. I want to not be weaker than I was before this whole thing, because right now we're all, we use that, the fear word. We know it's not a good word, but, but that's the, the world is full of, I mean, we're, we're we're being conditioned right now to, to be fearful um, because we don't know what, but, but, you know, as we look at history, not to, not to deny history, but as we look at it, we can't even trust that anymore because the way, the way that that's laid out is not truthful anymore either. So I love your point of being in the here and now and starting right now, this second. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, is it a lot easier for me to not assume how you're going to treat me, but to examine what you are doing? Right. I, I mean, I, I can I can address what you're doing at this very moment, but I can only speculate on what you did in the past, mm-hmm. and I can only think about what you might do in the future. <laughs> but if I just deal with the here and now, that's real. That is. That, that, that's 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 real, and I can I can also say to you that I believe that one of the greatest challenges we here have in dealing with the here and now is that all too often we we become victims, not victors. Hmm. There are people who envy others because, well, I didn't have what you know, I didn't have this, I didn't have that. How did you get? Even as we deal with things in, in, in the simplicity of life to how do we reconcile what transpired through slavery? What, well, there has to become a proper perspective. And I, I think we're looking through a life through glasses that the world would, would prepare, mm-hmm. but we're not looking at it through the word of God. Mm-hmm. And, and if we were to do what's right, Here's what I here's how I like to define God's effort toward us. We he wants us to do whatever we do so that it affects or has a positive effect on the person we are appointing it to. Because mm-hmm. love isn't really love until I give it to someone. Because love is an action. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, if I don't do the things that are actionable to call to, it's one thing to say I love you. But it's another thing to be actionable, which defines what I mean when I say I love you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and make, make no mistake about it. Um, you and I both agree that there is only one way that we're saved, and that's through the atonement of Jesus. Um, but we, there's also a process through this life where we lean on each other, where we take advantage of being saved by enlightening it and, 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 and turning, helping each other turn our hearts to Christ and take advantage of that atonement in every way. And I think that we're interdependent. When you preach to your congregation on Sunday, you're saved in doing what you're called to do. 
in, in a sense. You, 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 find, you, find, you take advantage of the salvation of Jesus in taking that opportunity. If people take that word that you're giving them, they take advantage of it. When we go serve someone, we're interdependent on being a disciple of Christ in the service, and the person receiving it is interdependent. I mean, we, we need each other. We need each other. Amen. And, and why is all of this confusion? It's to stop that. It's to stop that fact that we need each other. We need to lean on each other. We need to love on each other. And we need to lift each other. That seems like a truth to me. Well, it, here's, a, here's, a, here's another truth in, in applying what, you, what we've kind of talked about. Mm-hmm. When you look at the, uh, cur- the current day situation, and the protesters, uh, when you look at in the daylight, 99.9% of all of the activities that are going on are legal, lawful, within the, uh, the limits and the foundation of the Constitution. Uh-huh. And at nighttime, it all seems to change uh-huh. because evil waits and it operates in darkness. Uh-huh. It, if the light shines on it, it can no longer be evil. Uh-huh. The sadness is, is that there are a multitude of people out there that are abiding in wanting to do right, but evil has just enough representation that it gets 99% of the exposure. Mm-hmm. People don't talk about what people are doing that is really relevant and good. How long did it take us to get off the subject of what happened to Floyd and how people were condemning it to all that was now on, if you will, the news was how the looting and all of that, that that became more dominant in the news. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. The bad things are overshadowing, getting more exposure because we, we seem to like the bad things. It's entertainment. We we don't want, we we don't want to watch the news. Uh, We don't want to watch the weather on the 10 o'clock news and hear about how it's going to be sunshine tomorrow. We want, we want that storm that's over in Honewald right now to make them in and whoop us. That's what we're scared of. That's, that's the entertainment. And that's, that's what gets them ratings. You know, (laughs) you're correct. And that's, and I think that's, that's the challenge for us to put it in proper perspective that there's much more evil will lose out to good no matter what. Mm -hmm. I don't care how large the number or the amount of evil, good will always overcome evil. Mm -hmm. And if we, and and this is the season that we find ourselves in this year. This is the season that we find in this moment is that we are going to have to choose between good and evil. Mm -hmm. We can no longer sit on the sideline because I think in in years past that we have grown more and more accustomed to saying, you know what, that that, that doesn't affect me. I'm going to sit on the sideline. I don't have to speak after that. You look at the diversity in the protesters. Mm -hmm. There's a togetherness that's greater than we've probably ever seen. Uh-huh. And so one of the, one of the greatest things that uh, the enemy always sees is opportunity because we were encouraged to wear a mask when we were out in the public. Huh. It became easy for the enemy to infiltrate light because we'll just wear a mask and they don't know who we are and we can go do what we want to do. And we won't, nobody will have any suspicion about us because we're wearing a mask like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was against the law to walk into a bank without a mask before February. Yeah. Right? And, and there was a time when you walked into the bank with a mask up. With, with that's, right. that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, speaking of some of the good, let me just say uh, once, once again, Pastor Wayne McCullough, Limestone Baptist Church, 1613 West Main Street, Franklin, Tennessee. And let me tell you something good that goes on often over there. And, Manna from On High Food Pantry, um, that's the third Saturday of every month from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the parking lot of Limestone Baptist Church. They're partners with uh, the Giving Garden, which is which is with another uh, congregation, First United Methodist Church in Franklin. Is that correct? They're correct. Partners with them, partners with the Second Harvest Food Bank in Middle Tennessee. Uh, this is an awesome opportunity to serve. If you are in the Franklin area on the third Saturday of every month from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., just come, roll up your sleeves. Get ready to love and get ready to smile. Get ready to get in line and, and help uh, load food and and get it processed so that people can uh, can get the help they need. It's it's an awesome thing. It's a beautiful thing, and uh, I love you. Can do many many things at Limestone Baptist Church, but I love that one. Love to be a part of that anytime that I can. Thank you. Anything else? Well, uh, let me just speak to that subject you just addressed. Uh, that on that on every third Saturday we actually do two ministries. One is called Matthew twenty five. By the grace of God, we've been doing now for going on probably 17 years or greater. 
And this is where we, it's kind of like Meals on Wheels, where we take uh, uh, hot plates to, or lunch and food to uh, home, those who are homebound, the elderly or mm-hmm. uh, handicapped, et cetera. And, or it's just those who are in need and can't get out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, before this pandemic, we definitely spent time with them and in, 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 in just not only delivering the food, but also the word of God to eat. Mm-hmm. Well, God has gracefully, wonderfully been faithful to that ministry. I thank God for what he's doing. And I would just ask your prayers and to continue to help us to continue that effort. The, the food bank, uh, the effort in uh, Manna from on High, uh, it's been going on now for about five years. And there are a lot of food banks, I would say, a lot of efforts providing food. And here's our purpose, because I think that's important. We're not really just trying to uh, make sure that those who are hungry are fed as much as we are want to help not only provide for those who are hungry, but to provide with the working challenged. Uh-huh. You know, there are many people who are working every day, giving 40 uh, greater hours a week to their job. Right. And those people are still having difficulty of paying their rent. And mm-hmm. and it has, it's not because they're not working. It's because they're not being compensated mm-hmm. in an adequate way. So what we've tried to do is that we want to help them supplement uh, with through providing them with food and goods that will allow them to take their resources and apply to other things mm-hmm. and help them in the long run. Yeah. I, I'm thankful to that effort because, you know, it doesn't matter to us if a person pulls up in a Continental or a Mercedes or uh, or BMW or, or Volkswagen or uh, what Range Rover, whatever. It, that's not our concern. Our concern is, is that if people are coming, we believe they are in a need. And it's up to them to have to deal with whether or not they, sure. they are in the right area or not. But the other thing is, is that it has been my pleasure and a great privilege that when people were able to come and sit with us, that they came to us and not only just for food, but, but for the spiritual wellness, they would ask for prayer. They, mm-hmm. they, they'd involve you in their their family affairs and things of that nature. And it was such a blessing. They, they they became more than clients. Mm-hmm. They became mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. And the, the diversity that we experience in this effort is tremendous. Mm-hmm. If, if you've been there, you're saying it, it's not for just one, it's not for just blacks, it's not just for mm-hmm. trade folks, it's for everybody. It's and, for and we're getting people who are from every walks of life yeah. and we're thankful that the lord is able to minister to those folks in, in each that we meet wherever they may be and it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is we 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 don't want to just uh, have church we want to be church mm, i love that and, and that is that is important to us because we recognize that as paul says we have not obtained that which has attained us mm. however though we strive to glorify god and that means that whatever our weaknesses is, we we strive to overcome it. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I would tell you is that the, the greatest fear that people have is to be overcome by the greatest challenge I believe that the church has. No matter what their fear is, no matter what they are dealing with in life, the greatest challenge is for us to carry the gospel to the world. And that in the times such as this or in times past or times yet to come, should always be the church's main function. You know, it's wonderful for us to minister people through Banner from on High in Matthew 25, but that is only so that they can see the manifestation of a living word, uh-huh. that God's word is true and is alive. It's not just something you read about. You can see it. They can read the Bible through the actions of the saints of God so that, therefore, it will bring them to the closeness of God. And that's where I believe the church must become focused. Mm-hmm. That's where I think if there's ever any loss of power that the church should have is because we're not focusing on our, our, our primary task, and that is to tell the world that Jesus Christ mm-hmm. is King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. And let me ask you this: Is that even better achieved when the individual congregations of a community and the different congregations of a community unite in those in those truths together? I mean, when when, when we when we stand together and, and come together for spreading that word and for sharing it, it takes us all. It takes all of us. 
It's just like feeding people. The way one church feeds people and, and covers those Maslow's hierarchy of needs we learned back in grade school, remember that? The way one church does that and the way another church does that are different. They're different areas. They, they do it differently. They cover different people. But if a community is going to be taken care of spiritually and the physical needs, it takes everybody working together. I, I, I'm so glad you said that because I think there too, there's too much competitiveness in the church. Mm-hmm. Meaning, I should pray for your efforts. And one thing I do believe, Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're going to ever run out of opportunity to glorify God by being our, big, being our brother's keeper mm-hmm. or that the strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. Mm-hmm. I believe that if, if our heart is full with the spirit of giving, God will always have more out there than we can ever do because, it, like you say, it requires all of us. Yep. And so, therefore, the actions that we display to show unity is what I believe an expression of love because it requires love, action that pleases God for us to be able to show unity. And yes, if we come together, when we allow the spirit of the Lord to be more visible than we, (laughs) that's when I believe the world changes. Well, and and you know what? The one old adage, I think, that's that's plagued us through the various religions from the time that we got off at Plymouth Rock, probably here in this country, is that if I unite with someone else from a different congregation, from a different church, different religion, then I am condoning the things that they do or they believe or the way they worship that I don't agree with. We got to forget about that part. We got to come together for the things we have in common and join together and, and, and serve for those things. Just because you join together to serve the community with, with another church does not mean you have to agree with every single thing that they say, believe in the way they worship. That's, that, that's not what that's doing. What that's saying is I tolerate you. I love you. Uh, and we're going to find things together because guess what? Jesus is going to come one day. I've been trying to follow him my whole life. You've been trying to follow him your whole life. And we're going to follow him when he comes again, wherever he tells us to go. That's where we're going to go. And I'm probably a little wrong and you're probably a little wrong. And we're right in him. Uh, there's no question that we are all wrong. <laughs> Not a little. <laughs> right. Because they're only right. Only the one that's good is God. Right. And, and, and I would tell you that this is, I don't mean for this to be offensive, only for my, uh, just a, a brain process. Mm-hmm. process of think mm-hmm. through what I just what I'm about to say and 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 allow the spirit to speak truth to you on it. Mm-hmm. Denominations were created by man. Unity was created by God. He didn't send us a lot of saviors. Mm-hmm. He sent us one savior. And in the Bible is it, it, that's the only reference that I can refer to that that is my discipline. It says too clearly that he is the way and no man can come to the father except that's by right. his son. That's right. I don't care any other means. I, I can only get to him through him. <laughs> That's now that I choose to believe that. That everybody that just because someone may believe something different than that, even what I believe requires me to still have love, patience, long suffering, endurance, kindness, gentleness, peace toward all individuals mm-hmm. that I come in contact with, mm-hmm. even if they don't see it mm-hmm. like I see it. In the middle of his greatest suffering, he looks to the thief, shows nothing but love and compassion. He looks to the soldiers, shows who are, remember, they have a different color skin than he does, and they are from a different complete culture than he does, and he has plenty of reason to be angry at them. What does he do? He turns to the Father and says, forgive them. But they know not. They know not what they do. What greater example? What, what else is there but to look to the example of Jesus? Amen. Um, I love the human side of that. And there's, there's always a spiritual side, but I love, if I can't, if I, in, in scripture or in song, if I can't see the dirt under the fingernails, if I can't smell the sweat, if I can't see the human, I can't get it. And that's what, that's what I love. It takes, it takes teachers and pastors to bring scripture to life. That's why we're part of the vehicle. It ta- you know what I mean? Anytime we can, we can do that. And I, and I love that. And you know what? Your choir, uh, I'll never forget. Please tell, please tell everyone at, at Limestone that the Nashville Tree Band loves them. We'll never forget the experience of the time we performed together with your choir, um, the few times we have. And that helped those 
songs, help those stories from the old, old from the New Testament and the Old Testament come to life and, and come real. I love you for making things come alive for people and, and making them understand. I love that you have that uh, call and you have that that desire. I've, I've seen you do it. I've seen you do it on the on the on the steps of the a courthouse in downtown Franklin and in, in, uh, moments of prayer where we've all gathered people from all kinds of different religions. I love that, that ha- that's happened literally on the town square where the civil war spilled blood all over the place for all those reasons, literally in that same place. Um, I love you, my friend. I'm grateful you, to have you as a friend. Let's go to work. Loving people. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all right. Please subscribe to our podcast, Nashville Tribute Band Listening Room. And please share us with your friends. Tell them about our Instagram, our podcast, and of course, our music. And please visit us on our Facebook page, Nashville Tribute Band, and hit that like button. And please take the opportunity to visit our store at NashvilleTributeBand.com for music and merchandise. We'll see you next week. Be good and do good things. You've been listening to the Nashville Tribute Band Podcast, The Listening Room with Jason Deere. Make sure and subscribe to our podcast and share it with your friends. And visit NashvilleTributeBand.com for music, information, and so much more. And make sure and enjoy this podcast each and every week.